While the government's rolling out its work-focused welfare program, other parties and agencies are also rolling out their ideas. An experts' advisory group to the Commissioner for Children has produced a discussion paper suggesting options that include a universal child payment up to the age of five to combat the impact of poverty on children. When the Greens co-leader, Materia Toure, raised that suggestion with the Prime Minister, he dismissed it as a dopey idea that would give rich families even more for their kids. But Ms Toure already has another approach that's due for debate in Parliament next month. Selwyn Manning's been talking to the Greens co-leader about the government's programme and the Green alternatives. Uh, Materia Toure, uh, welcome to the programme. Sure. Yeah. Uh, Social Development Minister Paula Bennett has rolled out the national-led government's uh, social welfare reform. Mm. And what's your take on that reform? It is very much like the early 90s reforms. And in fact, I think they are uh, finishing the program that they tried to start then. In actually. what way is that? I think they are increasing the very punitive approach to welfare. Uh, instead of a more supportive approach. And that's what they were doing in 91. They were the ones that cut benefits back so radically then. They, those benefits have never been increased, um, even under Labour, didn't mm. do anything really to increase benefits properly. Uh, La National is now not only bringing in a new cut with their new reforms, but are increasing the punishments for mm. beneficiaries for failing to meet uh, obligations that in many respects will be very difficult for them to meet. Well, let's look at those punishments, that exclusion criteria, mm. if you want to put it that way, um, a little bit later. Sure. Um, but first off, what we see rolled out from Paula Bennett is, um, in essence, there are three kind of new categories that have been framed here. Uh, uh, job seeker support, uh, sole parent support, and supported living uh, payment. So. Within that band, um, some people are saying that this is good in a sense, that it's giving clarity around um, uh, an ethos, if you, if you like, where beneficiaries are expected to be positioning to re-enter the workforce. Is that new? No, that's not new. And in fact, Labor uh, brought in with the re reforms of the Social Security Act, the kind of work focus part of welfare, actually. And, and National is continuing with that. Now, I agree with the... Um, simplifying the benefit categories mm. and that has been one of our intentions for a long time well, too because they've mm. always been rather complicated that yeah. you should have a basic um, provision for everybody and then um, different targeted payments if you like for different needs so a is sole it, parent for example would have a particular need in taking care of their child. Is it right though to bring across sickness benefit into this job seeker category? No. It seems that it's quite at odds to the well, we certainly never do that because uh, you're right. Simplifying the categories is one thing, but if at the same time as, as Paula is doing, you're cutting the benefit because many of those people will lose um, or have reduced benefit as a result, but also putting a much stronger work focus on those who are the least able to work, uh, you're simply making it harder for them to live. Plus, the system itself has changed, so there's no longer case managers in the same way that there used to be. Uh, so, so there aren't people in WINS who are working very closely with beneficiaries on what can be done and what support that they need. I think the other major mm. issue is that there's nothing in the welfare reforms that reflects the fact that one, we're in a recession and therefore there mm. will be benefits numbers will increase mm. and that is just the way it works when there's more jobs there's fewer people on benefits mm. um, but also that when people are on a benefit they're entitled to dignity mm. they're entitled to a decent standard of living mm. uh, and they're entitled to respect for their needs and none mm. of that is reflected in the welfare reforms it seems the centrist position parties and those in the centre right very much need to address it, uh, these issues to satisfy the wants of the stakeholder groups and perhaps a, a block of New Zealand that votes in a way where they, they feel like they're being ripped off by beneficiaries. But at yeah. the end of the day, are there the jobs? And are you <laughs> seeing as a politician mm. political solutions to job creation? No, there aren't the jobs. So uh, currently with all of the work tested beneficiaries on the books, we need 87,000 new jobs, full mm. and part-time jobs. They are just not there and we are losing more jobs than are being created. Okay. The government doesn't have an actual mm. job creation plan and that's not about government creating jobs, mm. but they don't have any kind of economic plan that encourages genuine job growth, sustainable job growth in the medium or the long term. So, you know, with the Green Party op, um, moving yeah. in on this particular thing and your green economics starting to actually 
uh, get momentum. What What is your solutions to job creation out there? What opportunities are there? We have produced, uh, particularly over the election with our green jobs package, we produce a very comprehensive set of solutions. Um, so. Like they range from very basic jobs, riparian planting support mm. for farming communities in rural areas that will employ young people, it's very sustainable work, it's very rurally based so therefore it helps with development in rural areas where um, economic issues are very acute. Uh, we can provide support to the farming community as well so they actually get the benefit of um, an integrated approach between government, local councils and the farmers or so helping with employment opportunities. So there's that kind of level so would, of job. So would, would that draw people but, in the low skilled areas? Well yes it is, it's a, it's a fairly low skilled job mm -hmm. but it also, so that, and that, young that, people too who are you know, trying yeah. to develop those skills. Would that, would that come at a cost to central government? The taxpayer yes. funds would so how, how would it return that, uh, that, that cost mm. back by way of investment? Well, by way of, it depends on what you mean by investment. You know, do we believe we should be investing in people so that they are developing skills, so that we are protecting our environment, our environment is b better able to cope with the economic demands we keep placing on it? We think, yes, you can invest in, the, in people, you can invest in the environment, and you do get a net benefit out of it in various different ways. So the farming community, for example, is very keen on uh, mechanisms to help them clean up their waterways because they know that there is enormous economic advantage to them to do that. If government and local councils and farming communities can work together, then we can provide the solution. Mm -hmm. But it's not just about um, that kind of skilled jobs as well. We talked a great deal about how we could use the state-owned energy assets mm. to help um, develop sustainable, new sustainable businesses, very high tech mm. sustainable businesses that also produce things so there was some manufacturing attached to it. Mm. But we're very much creative industries um, where we, we could get significant job growth over time, mm. um, particularly because there's this huge international interest and boom mm. in sustainable energy development. So your, your critics would be saying, okay, does this come at the cost of increased taxes or an adjustment in priorities? It's an adjustment in priorities. Okay, thanks. So we've that. always said that governments choose where they put their money. Uh, they, you know, this government is making very poor choices. Okay, uh, recently, this month, Paula Bennett announced a series of exclusion criteria that would be applied to those who already have legal entitlement to benefits. Yeah. Um, and those criteria are like, for example, beneficiary parents must ensure their children attend 15 hours a week of early childhood education, yeah. attend school from the age of five or six, so one would imagine that beneficiary parents whose kids are truant could um, have their benefits slashed perhaps in that area, yep. enrol in it with a G GP, a general practitioner, doctor, etc. Now these exclusion criteria, what impact does that have from your point of view on the actual child, the well-being <laughs> of the child here? Well, it makes it very difficult for those families to meet these criteria actually. Like the 15 hours early child education is just a nonsense. Most kindergartens the vast majority don't provide 15 hours for, for three-year-olds. Uh, so Paula has said that people will be able to get exceptions mm. and so won't have to Exclusions to, be, to yeah, the exclusion. exclusion. But yeah. how will they know that? Then, mm. uh, you know, will they get that information? Will they actually get these so-called exceptions? Or will they just feel like they're under even more pressure and therefore step away from the system even more? If you want people to enrol with a GP or get access to healthcare, it has to be accessible to those people. It has to be responsive. It has to be local. You know, many uh, people on benefits can't afford transport or transport costs are very high. So well, if you're expecting people to be able to access early child education, but it is not within walking distance when you have one in the pram and one, a little one, a three-year-old walking beside you, well, how do you expect people to even get there mm. when they're already so financially constrained? There's no no understanding of the way people, ordinary New Zealanders who rely on a benefit, are trying to live their lives. What evidence is there out there that you've been privy to uh, first hand mm. that shows a consequential impact on between this type of policy rolling out and really what is happening to children, kids out there? We know that more than 150,000 beneficiary children um, are living in severe poverty and there is not a single measure produced by the Minister that will alleviate that poverty. Not a single thing she has produced in the four years that she's been Minister has done anything to reduce that poverty. In fact, it's getting worse. Well, um, we let's, look, so. let's look at your solutions then yeah. as Green Party co-leader. Um, what would you do to address this now mm. or after the next election? 
Uh, in a month's time, my uh, members bill to have the in-work tax credit, which provides $60 a week to most families, low-income working families, um, my bill will transform that into a genuine child payment that is available to beneficiary families. Like, like the, um, the, uh, like child, the old family yeah, benefit. Family, family benefit. Yeah, like the now, old family benefit. Now, now, we know the numbers in Parliament. Will you get that through? Is it an academic exercise? Uh, no, it's very close. At the moment, I have um, 60 votes. And so uh, I know that. So it's you'd just need a John Banks? <laughs> John Banks or Peter Dunn? John Banks or Peter Both Dunn? Both or one? Just one of them. So to Peter get Dunn would be the one you'd be going Peter Dunn is the, is, is the one who's most reasonable. Um, and he does need to make a decision about what he's going to do. He said he hasn't decided yet, or at least he hasn't advised me of de mm. his so, decision. So people should watch for a month for that and to see what is coming yeah. out. And the other thing is um, post 2014. Um, clearly, uh, the Labour Party and the Green Party seem to be showing a red-green kind of mm -hmm. arrangement, if you like, both economically and the dynamic in the House and the opposition bloc. There's an assumption out there, if you look at the polls, that the Green Party would be a part of executive government should the numbers go that way. Is that a reality, that assumption? Would the Green Party, are you kind of guys wanting to be in government or would you prefer being in a, in a situation where you lobby from the outside the executive? We want government. You Absolutely. want government? Absolutely. Do your Absolutely. members support that wholeheartedly? Yes. yes, and I think that we have been planning for it for a long time. We have never had the opportunity to be in government. We know that government for smaller parties, MMP parties, can be quite destructive. And so we have planned and are thinking this through very carefully because mm. we want to be successful in government. And to sustain. And yeah, that's right, which is not the case with other parties. Yeah. Most other parties lose vote yeah. once they've entered into a government's right. arrangement. So we know what the risks are. We are old enough and big enough to handle that. Uh, but it, it's not just on anybody's terms. You know, it's on our terms what kind of arrangements we might have. Mm. We, do, we, we do want to be part of a progressive government in the future, whether it's at 2014 or after, if we, we yet to see the numbers. If you, if you saw a broad coalition being necessary after the next election, and New Zealand First was basically the <laughs> one that was sitting there deciding, well, which way should it go? Should it remain in opposition, give confidence yeah. apply? Would, would, if, it, if Winston Peters, for example, wanted another go at executive government, would the Green Party actually embrace that to get over the line? Uh, I mean, we, we haven't excluded a relationship mm. with New Zealand First in a governance environment, but we're very far away from how that might look at this stage. Mm. Um, they did go out of Parliament for a period of time. They're back in on fairly, comparatively fragile numbers, so we really it's really hard to tell what might happen. But our, our focus is very much on what would we do, uh, how will we prepare ourselves and for what that, would that role. Be? Well, with respect to no, child poverty. Oh, absolutely. So um, we abs we need to have child poverty reduction measures in legislation. We need to deal with income issues both for beneficiaries but also for the working poor. So that's increasing the minimum so wage. So working for families, lowering the tear down. Well, well, you could, there's different ways of doing it. One of them is a child payment or a, a universal child payment that's been suggested by the Children's Commissioner is quite a good plan for zero to sixes and then targeted thereafter. They have some very good solutions for child poverty that we would want to embed in our policy as well. Um, but there's other things like the $10,000 tax free band for, um, for New Zealanders which would have a bigger increase for those on lower incomes. There's lots of different kinds of solutions. They need to be negotiated, of course, with any other party and we need to work those through with the public as well. Matari Uturi, thank you very much. Kia ora. Selwyn Manning talking to Greens co-leader Materia Toure. Well, we've invited Social Development Minister Paula Bennett to come in for an extended interview on the welfare reforms and child poverty, but so far she's said no. So that's all for this edition of the Beats and Interview. Thanks for your company. See you next time. Supporting local content so you can see more of New Zealand on air.